Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Linda Larkey. I'm a professor at ASU and have and also a research affiliate with the Mayo Clinic. And um, you can blame me for bringing Dr. Roger Yonka here. Um, he has um, come as a consultant on a grant that I have from the NIH, uh, one of those nice ones that last a few years, uh, that is testing the effects of Qigong and Tai Chi Easy on uh, the, the, uh, the fatigue that breast cancer patients have, breast cancer survivors. And we'll be doing this study uh, with a, a three-arm design, uh, and one of the arms, of course, is the, the Qigong and the Tai Chi portion of it. So Roger has worked with me for many years as a, an expert, uh, nationally known expert in, in Qigong and Tai Chi and the Tai Chi Easy practice that we're using in the intervention. And so he's here as a consultant on that grant, and we arranged to have him come out and, and spend a little time with you. So I get to introduce him today. Um, he is a physician of Chinese, Asian Chinese medicine with 15 years of clinical practice, oh, I'm sorry, 35 years of clinical practice, and he's the founder and director of the Institute of Integral Qigong and Tai Chi. It's a research and training institute that's trained over a thousand teacher and practice leaders internationally. He's the chairperson of the Healer Within Foundation and the founder of the National Qigong Association. Also, he's the author of uh, many books and chapters and articles, but the two books that have most profoundly impacted our field is The uh, Healer Within and The Healing Promise of Qigong and Tai Chi, which became an instant classic in energy medicine and mind-body practice. One of the things that I've uh, been most intrigued with and learning about is, because um, I know uh, Dr. Yanka mostly through my experience in getting trained by him as in, in Qigong and Tai Chi, but also then as a research partner along the way for the last 12 years. But over time, I've begun to learn more about his active work out in the world with corporations and, found and um, agencies as a leading consultant in the design and implementation of integrative medicine programs. And so he's worked within several hospitals and healthcare systems since 1995, back in the days when we didn't even have the term integrative health, but it was called holistic health, and programs were beginning to develop um, their, their uh, centers. He's worked as a consultant and, a, and often invited as a, as a speaker with the American Hospital Association, the American Medical Association, the Voluntary Hospital Association, the American College of Healthcare Executives, the National Council on Aging, Kaiser Health, and also with Mayo Clinic in the past, um, and Veterans Administration. And in that content, context, he's assisted in both the clinical design and cost-efficient group-based wellness kind of programs, including body-mind practice and um, health and wellness coaching. So his engagement with um, our research over the next five years we're really looking forward to, but I'm hoping that you will enjoy his review of mind, body, and integrative medicine strategies for, the integrative, uh, for an integrative cancer program, which is something that is ongoing in its development right here and now with Denise Milstein leading. So please welcome with me Dr. Dr. Roger Yanka. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, so we'll just jump right in. My um, idea, what I gathered from being in, uh, the people that I've been communicating with, is that uh, there's two topics here this morning. The first one is the idea of integrative medicine generally, and then uh, and the implementation of that in health systems and then to speak to the uh, single uh, feature of integrative medicine, which is mind-body practice. So these are the required slides. Uh, let me just give you a little bit on the objectives. Understand key features in the rationale and development process for integrative medicine programming. Define mind-body practice and delineate the three mindful points of focus that are common to yoga, qigong, and tai chi. Enable coaching of patients in, in the benefits and implementation of mind-body practice. 
and demonstrate a key breath practice for self-regulation of the autonomic nervous system function. And on that last one, you can go ahead with your breath practice, right? Because it doesn't really require anything besides just taking a little bit deeper breath. Um, but I'll remind you of that later uh, as well. Uh, <clears throat> Linda just gave this list, thank you so much, so I won't have to hesitate on this slide. Wanted to be sure that you just uh, understand that I've been involved in these things uh, quite a bit for the last uh, 20 years, and then Chinese medicine for even longer than that. So why integrative medicine? <clears throat> there are three major uh, points on this. The first one is the flow of the funds. In other words, don't they say it? Follow the money. So that's an important one. People are interested, people want it, and then there's an evidence base that's emerging that's very compelling. So this is a slide uh, from the, uh, what is now called the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. And we'll talk a little bit about the history of the uh, centers and the offices at the NIH at some point. But just as a very brief note, in 1993, according to the uh, New England Journal of Medicine, people were spending somewhere around $13 billion on what was at the time called alternative medicine. Now, or the most recent research suggests that by 2009, this number had gone to uh, $34 billion. And the source for that is the, the new office, which is called National Center for Complementary and Integrative Medicine. And I'm going to show, I'm going to uh, drill down into this uh, a little further. This is the um, out of pocket expenses. Now, this is all about out of pocket expenses for complementary and in integrative medicine. So it doesn't, at this point, in 2009, it wasn't sophisticated enough and there weren't enough integrative medicines programs in hospital systems that were being re reimbursed to be a part of this uh, discussion. So I'm going to drill further. <clears throat> so when people spend money to uh, go to complementary and alternative practitioners, and the other is um, other complementary and alternative medicine, which includes Tai Chi and Qigong and yoga and nutritional counseling and health and wellness coaching and so forth. That's where that uh, $34 billion comes from. And then this just takes it further down to show the pie of, uh, this is practitioner costs, which is going to be uh, acupuncturists and chiropractors, and that's herbal medicine and um, vitamins and minerals, yoga, tai chi classes, homeopathic medicine, relaxation techniques. I think probably here is where your health coaching shows up. <clears throat> so now this is really an interesting chip of information from 1993, or actually 1991. In 1991, there was published a document called Healthy People 2000. So in other words, almost a decade previous to 2000, there was a plan, or an intended plan, <clears throat> for uh, healthcare in the United States. And part of the rationale was that 70% of disease was found to be pre preventable. So this is all the way back in 19, uh, and to be able to publish that in 1991, that had to be s uh, findings from the 1980s. And also, um, key, writers at the time, uh, Dr. Fries, and you may remember uh, Dr. Koop, 1993, from the New England Journal of Medicine, eight out of nine causes of disease are preventable. At the time, these were striking findings, I and mean, that's almost 100%, uh, or in the other case, declared at 70%. So somewhere between 70 and, let's say, 90% of all disease, uh, according to people who supposedly know what they're talking about, are preventable. So what does that mean relative to treatment and the extent to which we are treating diseases that are preventable? 
And what does that mean in terms of the extent to which health systems are called upon to be, in fact, health systems as well as medical delivery systems? Just very, very provocative question worthy of asking. Here's another way to look at this, which is amazing. We've got the 10 leading causes of death, which are classic, and you can look this up on the internet anytime you want to, and the, the most recent version of this is 2013, with heart disease and cancer towards the top, and et cetera. But let's drill down into this one. <clears throat> is it true that heart disease is a cause of death, or is it actually true that, or is there a better way to say it, which is that heart disease is, has a cause. What is the cause of the cause, in other words? And this is that uh, eight out of nine uh, causes of death uh, in another article from the Journal of the American Medical Association in which the nine actual causes of death are revealed. And notice that these, uh, none of these things actually, or very few of these things, are managed in hospitals or medical systems or doctor's offices. Uh, tobacco happens at home and at work. Dietary patterns happen at home and at work. Alcohol happens whenever it happens, but not usually at the hospital. Microbial agents uh, <coughs> are treated in a hospital, but where do you get them? You know, they, they, all of this is just happening out in the world. Toxic agents, firearms, sexual behavior, motor vehicles, illicit use of drugs, all of these are actually centered in people's lives. And so the question becomes, is a medical delivery system in any way responsible for supporting people in preventing these causes of death, or these causes of the causes of death. But here's an even more interesting one. Drill it down one more. What are the eight root causes of death? If somewhere between 75 and 95 percent of all disease is preventable, then where is that prevention going to happen? Or what is it that we've overlooked that is the cause of the fact that we're not preventing preventable diseases. Lack of information and healthful lifestyle skills, a compromised self-reliance, and you know, your medical uh, delivery practitioners, providers of services in a medical context. So as we're going down this list, think to yourself about the people who are your clients and see if you recognize any of these uh, issues, external and internal stress, low self-esteem. Let's just take low self-esteem for a moment. How many people probably in this room ever smoked cigarettes, and how often was that because you wanted to be accepted by the kids that you were hanging around with, and how typical would it be that that was actually motivated by your lack of the ability to say no, shall we say, in a social situation. Uh, you know, just thinking it through. Misinformation, anger and frustration, disempowered, uh, fear-driven, fear economic inequity, confusion. And there, these are just, this is just a short list of all the different ways that could, this could be, these ideas could be stated. So then, probably back around 1997 and then into 2002 and five and so forth, the question became, what is it that people are really wanting if they're spending billions of dollars on alter what was at the time called alternative medicine, what are they trying to accomplish? What is it they really want? And the big question was, do they really want alternative medicine treatments? In other words, was it true that they you know, wanted to have an alternative to the medical system, or was it in fact true, uh, I'll just read it, or do they really want a redesign 
of delivery, including individualized design of treatment and behavioral options, including self-directed care, coaching, and mind-body practice. Now, we know in 2015 that the whole concept of individualized care is a really powerful new buzzword or new concept that we're all attending to. And so this is actually happening, and it's very, very impressive. My last little note here is that given the fact that people <clears throat> want this, and wh what I mean by people is uh, consumers, but I also mean policymakers and people who are doing the evidence base and uh, finding the findings and noting the trends and so forth. So originally in 1993, or maybe it was 1992, the NIH, by an act of Congress, created the Office of Alternative Medicine, which was then transformed into NCCAM, National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, which then has recently been named again as the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. So this whole process, starting in the 80s and the 90s of the last millennium, is now really gaining momentum. And the amount of money <clears throat> that is, when the original Office of Alternative Medicine was opened, it was two or three million dollars. That was it. That was about enough to be able to pay for the office and the people who were working there. And at this point, I don't remember the latest uh, statistic, but it's into the hundreds of millions of dollars annually that are budgeted to this office to be able to do the research and build the evidence base and so forth. So just a few things about, um, I know that you're in the process of creating an integrative cancer program and that many of the organizations in your community are doing the same thing. And so I'll give you just a real quick outline of what these programs are usually made up of and comment just briefly on, on a few of those things. Uh, so integrating complementary therapies, and notice I've got a note down here that says therapeutics require credentialing of providers in professions that are often controversial. So in terms of getting up the slope, if you will, of, a, of adaptation or adoption of the, uh, these kinds of things in typical medical delivery settings, it's a pretty high bar to get over. Now, in my community in Santa Barbara, uh, acupuncture was actually uh, credentialed in our regional hospitals way back. And that was in part because there was a, a College of Oriental Medicine in that town and a lot of uh, <clears throat> networking and so forth going on. But it is not that easy, particularly, excuse me, <clears throat> it is not that easy, particularly when we get to things like homeopathic medicine that people don't even have a lot of agreement on, herbal medicine, which has, you know, all kinds of unusual sourcing going on. So this is hard. This part is very complex. However, and these are the things that I found as a consultant in designing these programs. However, what's easy, and why is it easy? Because these practices, uh, in integrative medicine type practices, body-mind practice methods, support groups and health coaching, mind-body practice, tai chi, qigong, yoga, meditation, you've heard the buzzword mindfulness, a kind of meditation, conventional health education and fitness, nutritional counseling, and health resource center like library information, website, and all of that, these are easy to implement because they are not therapies, they're educationally based, credentialing is nowhere near as hefty, if at all, and high patient satisfaction and patient-centered value. In other words, patients find it really impressive when an organization implements these mind-body practices. And it's, it, I'll just say it this way, if you're an organization that's developing <clears throat> an integrative medicine department or program, the biggest bang for the buck and the easiest thing to accomplish is something like this. Because the politics, the funding, 
And the credentialing are all so much easier. Now, we talk, I talked a little bit about the evidence base, and um, this is one of my f most fun sli couple of slides to be able to show, because uh, myself and Dr. Larkey, who uh, introduced me, did a, a review of the literature on one aspect of mind-body practice, which is Tai Chi and Qi Gong, a, a while back, which was published in the American Journal of Health Promotion. And so I'll just show you a couple of slides on this. And the power here is that it used to be that we did not have this evidence base, so that in terms of program, the question was, well, it sounds interesting, sure, Tai Chi, been around for a long time, but what's the evidence base? So now, the question isn't, well, that's an interesting idea, but what's the evidence base? The question is, you know, when can we get started? Because the proof for safety and efficiency or effectiveness or efficacy is all been done, published, and published a while ago. So basically what we did was looked at uh, randomized controlled trials, and uh, I won't spend a lot of time here, but the, the, the biggest killer, remember the biggest killer, is heart disease, and it turned out that the most studies, or I'm sorry, the third most studies that were done on um, Tai Chi and Qigong were based on uh, intervening in some way or another in, in cardiopulmonary uh, you know, diag diagnoses. And then the second one, as you know, is that there's a, a lot of um, people who fall and have all the consequences of falling who didn't really need to fall. And there's so now there's billions of dollars in the healthcare delivery systems for falls prevention. And it turns out that Tai Chi and Qigong are among the most uh, efficient, safe, uh, methodologies for that. Uh, just going to uh, cancer and other chronic diseases, immune function and inflammation, there were lots of studies that were done on demonstrating safety and efficacy in that area. And then the highest one was for uh, anxiety and depression and stress. And so the research that had been done by the time we did this and in, in the uh, 2010 12 region uh, was that lots and lots of research had been done to prove that these practices are easy to implement and safe and effective and cost effective, by the way, because of the uh, group based delivery. And think of it this way when you can uh, get a dozen people or 20, 25, maybe even 30 or more people into a room with a Qigong and Tai Chi teacher, uh, what is the difference between that and having a person see you know, one individual healthcare provider? The money on that is striking in terms of the uh, financial efficiencies of delivering these kinds of services. And of course, the patients and the community are delighted that the hospital or the health system is uh, integrating these things because there's so much popular press on the benefit of these, these practices. So what are the physiological mechanisms that are triggered by, we'll keep this very simple and very brief, uh, oxygen delivery enhanced for all kinds of reasons having to do with the uh, parasympathetic um, function and the expanding the blood system accelerated lymph pr propulsion, breath practice. Do you remember that deep breath that you were gonna take? Go ahead and have another one. Notice every time you take a deep breath, how much did that cost? Uh, <clears throat> it's probably one of the cheapest health enhancement practices or modalities that's anywhere in the world. It's with you all the time, the breath, you know. Relaxation that triggers the relaxation response, which is the opposite of the stress response. Shift in neurotransmitters, which has to do with the, that whole array or cascade of effects, and enhanced immune function, which is also a consequence of triggering the relaxation response. Now, just to get really provocative, uh, I wanted to show something from the literature <clears throat> that is um, not even that recent, but 
very, very powerful, and that is the whole concept of the relaxation response in triggering the capacity, capacities for gene expression and also for sustained gene replication. Think of it this way, how do you lose your life? One of the ways that you lose your life is that the tissues in some part of yourself or globally within your own system depreciate in their capacity to express their functions and to replicate themselves. So what happens when you, uh, you know, discontinue replication of certain cells, whether it be eyesight cells, liver function cells, heart cells, uh, brain cells? I think you follow what I mean. And the sustainability of the capacity to be able to express and replicate has to do with the telomeres. You've probably heard a little bit about that. <clears throat> And so I went to the literature and found that Herbert Benson, who was the f original uh, relaxation response, uh, what do you call that, discoverer? Uh, you can't imagine that he discovered the relaxation response. He must have been the person who wrote it down and you know, got, got his name out there for it. Uh, Benson and team did genomic counterstress changes induced by the relaxation response. I'm going to give you a, a, a little quote from that, uh, from that group here in a moment. L later, I was able to find two others, one from India and one from China, also on the concept of uh, genetic expression. Genomic profiling in Asian Qigong practitioners, gene regulation by mind-body interaction. And then the third one, Sharma team, gene expression profiling in practitioners of Sudarshan Kriya, which is a, a type of yoga. So all of these are pointing in the direction of the fact that a human being can, because they're allowed to, and take the time to, and believe that there's value in shifting their internal environment with very, very simple and low-cost practices that change all the biological and physiological modalities that we, or uh, mechanisms that we just described, in addition to multitudes of other much more subtle and less easy to describe, uh, who was that? <laughs> was that the people at NASA? Are they going to blast something off? And so, you know, I mean, I wouldn't make a big deal about this, but just think of it. If you can reverse the extent to which your genes are depreciating in their capacity to keep you well and alive. What is that? What is that? You know, we used to call it the fountain of youth. So, I mean, you know, can you live forever? Probably not. Can you sustain your well-being for a longer time in your life? Yes, 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 yes. So the, the point that we're getting to here is that, that Integrative medicine programs don't just mean um, doing medical treatments. Integrative medicine programs mean integrating lower cost, easier to do, great evidence base, people are interested, behaviorally based lifestyle modification programs. Pretty, pretty darn interesting. So let's just see what the uh, conclusion of the Benson article was. It is becoming increasingly clear that psychosocial stress can manifest as system-wide perturbations of cellular processes, generally increasing oxidative stress and promoting a pro-inflammatory milieu. More recently, chronic psychosocial stress has been associated with accelerated aging at the cellular level, specifically shortened telomeres, low telomerase activity, decreased antioxidant capacity, and increased oxidative stress are co correlated with increased vulnerability to a variety of disease states. Whoa. That is just amazing. And I love the concept of system-wide. In other words, we have 
that concept of holistic. And in our, wor in our world, in our, the you know, progressive history of our uh, healthcare delivery definitions, we have tended to separate the body into its parts. And yet this factor that has to do with the sustainability of cell function, cell replication, and gene expression is everywhere. So as a consultant, I have found uh, that there are two very powerful type programs that can be implemented, implemented for very low cost, and those are psychosocial personal improvement methods which is life skills enhancement based on techniques called coaching and group support. You probably are doing that or will be doing that. The second one is mind-body practice, tai chi, qigong, yo and yoga, which include these features. Posture and gentle movement, breath practice. Go ahead, you can, you can adjust your posture too if you want to. Posture, breath practice, self-applied massage, you know, the different, have you ever said, oh my gosh, I need a massage, and then do nothing about it? What if you had the tools that a massage practitioner has? Your hands. <clears throat> do you need a license to give massage to yourself? You know, can you reach most of your body? People say, I can't reach most of my body, but you can. You can reach your feet, you can reach your ears, you can reach your head, your shoulders. There's just a spot on your back, it's maybe like that big on your back, that you can't reach. Just a thought. <clears throat> so then the, the opportunities to do this in institutions, what I found was that the easiest places to do integrative medicine are physical therapy department, comprehensive cardiac, comprehensive cancer, diabetes and metabolic health, health education and wellness, that's, that's an easy and a given, and then rehabilitation medicine. So these are the departments that I, as a consultant, discovered were the best and easiest places to um, infuse the insights and the, uh, the uh, modalities and so forth that go with alternative and complementary medicine. Then, maybe even more important, is partnership with, so, you know, Thinking of your organization, what is the extent to which you partner with fitness centers in the YMCA, community centers and senior centers, schools and universities? Hmm, ASU, thank you very much for, looks like there's a relationship with there. Social service agencies, faith-based health ministries, corporate uh, wellness and productivity. So the, what I found as a consultant was it's easier for an organization to have relationships with um, these kinds of uh, agencies in the community than it is to be able to construct a integrative medicine program within a hospital or healthcare system. That's not to say that it won't happen. It's not to say that it can't happen. Clearly, you're in the process of doing it. And yet, these are easy. And the kind of uh, partnership and communication and networking that happens between hospitals and delivery systems uh, and regional organizations like these are typically very welcome. So then here's a kind of a complex diagram, but this is the customer flow in the emerging new system where the person comes into comp consultation. This would be the uh, typical, usual, in uh, inflow of patients into a medical system, but then to refer them, not just occasionally, but maybe even always, that'll be what'll happen eventually, is that we will always uh, refer people into health and lifestyle maximization programming. And that is here, and this is where the mind-body practice and the health coaching and so forth happen. Then the uh, complementary medicine treatments, that's the acupuncture and the uh, herbal medicine and the homeopathic or whatever it might be, the supplementation and so forth. And then these, these colored arrows 
are how we, number one, keep people. We want to keep the uh, citizen, customer, in the healthy lifestyle maximization channel because that's cheap. That's, you do that at home, you know, you, uh, a person buys their own uh, uh, high um, fiber green foods and prepares them. The person learns how to, uh, how to cook those foods and th learns how to hydrate themselves and learns how to rest themselves and so forth. So forth. So this is um, this is the emerging new healthcare system right here, where everything is uh, integrated. In the old days, what they called the alternative medicine days, this part here was out someplace else. There was no communication between the acupuncturist or the chiropractor and the healthcare system, and uh, to a certain extent, there still isn't, as you know. Okay, now on to mind-body practice as a focus, and we're going to wrap this up um, pretty quickly. In 19, uh, 2005, uh, myself and a, a number of people, including Dr. Larkey, were involved in the national expert meeting on Qigong and Tai Chi, and uh, the University of Illinois was associated, uh, involved, uh, National Council on Aging, the Archstone Foundation put up the roughly $250,000 that made this possible. We had 40 people at a conference. That was the expert meeting. Uh, <clears throat> the question was, is it reasonable to make Tai Chi easy and accessible? And uh, as you can imagine, the answer was yes. And so there was a pr uh, the publication that came from that, the consensus report, which was then rolled up into policy and so forth. And when you look at the Affordable Care Act, you can see the effect of these kinds of consensus meetings uh, wherein it was discovered that the uh, evidence base was building and that it did make sense to implement Qigong and Tai Chi programs or mind-body practice programs. Here's the uh, key phrase from that consensus report. Tai Chi and Qigong are among the most accessible forms of physical activity and mind-body practice for diverse populations since they are low-cost, group-based, low impact, and relatively easy to learn. So here is the foundation of every kind of mind-body practice, sometimes called the three treasures. That's what they're called in the Chinese uh, uh, paradigm. Body practice, posture, and movement. So, you know, think to yourself, how much does it cost to adjust your posture? And is it possible that by adjusting your posture, creating more space for your organs, that function just will naturally happen to improve itself by some kind of an increment. Breath practice, to observe the breath as well as modify the breath. And um, I, I'm just reaching for my phone here. If you have one of these, you can do all kinds of things now about the whole process of self-observation, using yourself as a biofeedback mechanism, uh, one of the things that I have on here, if you want to write it down, is called the Insight Timer. And the Insight Timer, you can set this uh, kind of very gentle sounding gong to go off every 10 minutes or every 15 minutes or every hour, at which point when you hear the gong go off, you do the three treasures. And um, uh, then there's uh, some other uh, many more and more every day de uh, devices or applications that you can use this phone for to, to make yourself and in your relationship with your phone in one way or another into a biofeedback loop that is more consistently reminding oneself to do these practices. Uh, notice, changing your posture is not that big a deal. You can do it without going anywhere. Breath practice and modifying the breath, you can do that without going anywhere. Bringing your mind to present moment focus, you can do that with, without going anywhere. And you know, you've probably heard that phrase, uh, don't operate heavy equipment while doing these mind-body practices. Well, you would do this while you're driving. You would do this while you're carrying heavy things around. You can do this anytime you want to. So then on to the implementation of these ideas. <clears throat> uh, I work with an organization called the 
Healer Within Foundation, and the Healer Within Foundation has a what is called a national uh, nationwide dissemination project, and we have now done Tai Chi practice leader trainings in um, Nebraska, Arkansas, California, Arizona, South Carolina, Florida, uh, Georgia, Maine, Ohio, and Oregon. And um, our goal, or our motto, I guess you could call it the mantra, we train thousands to inspire millions to help heal themselves with these very, very easy Tai Chi type programs. And I'm just going to buzz through. These are just some pictures of people who were trained Omega Institute, National Wellness Institute. Uh, by the way, there were, uh, over the years, we've done three or four trainings there, and three people from Rochester Mayo were trained through that program. Uh, training done here in Phoenix, teachers, nurses, EMTs, tri tribal uh, representatives. Uh, three major projects with the Veterans Administration. <coughs> And this is a, the group from the New York VA. So in other words, if I can track back, and then we're going to do this very brief, brief, brief breath practice. Actually, let me introduce this breath practice so you can be doing it, because you can do it any time. So very simple breath practice to stimulate the production of these healing resources within. Lower your breath pace to six or less, between probably five or six breaths a minute. And you can do that by simply breathing in, go ahead, and then let it out oh so very slowly through your nose. And um, you know, do that at least three times, but you can do it more if you want to. But notice what you're feeling. And let me just track back now while you do that practice for a few moments. And notice that you can pay attention to what I'm saying at the same time as you modify your breath. And when you modify your breath, you are modifying your autonomic function. And when you modify your autonomic function, you produce resources within the body which upregulate the parasympathetic and downregulate the sympathetic and produce a whole array of different uh, internal resources, neurotransmitters, enzymes, and otherwise. You can do that while you're doing other things, including listening to me or driving your car or answering emails. So we started with the idea that uh, alternative medicine became interesting, you know, well, it's been interesting for decades, but we began to track it in 1993. Then uh, with the article in the New England Journal of Medicine. At the same time, there was the Office of Alternative Medicine at the NIH. And then over time, through uh, my work as a consultant, I discovered that it's a little easier to, to prevent disease in the community as opposed to in the clinic. So the whole concept of practices and methodologies towards improving personal lifestyle become uh, a reasonable strategy for managing the well-being of our nation. And <clears throat> the practices can be used, or the modalities that can be used, to, uh, to accomplish that are very, very, very much less expensive because they're group-based and they're provided by educators as opposed by, to medical providers. Now, one of the things that we could ask is, but wait a minute, if everybody's well, what are we going to do in our hospital? And I promise you, if we were to implement the ideas that we're talking about here on a, on a nationwide basis, uh, it would take decades. It, it's, it's taking decades, because we're in going in the direction of accomplishing this. And so the process for an or a medical organization to, trans, uh, <clears throat> to, trans, to transition to this way of doing things with these community partnerships and the whole idea of um, operationalizing nurses and uh, social workers and discharge planners to be able to speak this language. It's going to take 
time. So we're not in trouble anytime soon. And you may have noticed, if you've read the Affordable Care Act, there's a lot to argue about in the Affordable Care Act, but there's an amazing amount in the Affordable Care Act for prevention, incentives for prevention, tax incentives for pre prevention, and incentives for medical delivery systems to move much of their work into the prevention arena. So there's, if I could be so crass, there's money there. So in other words, if we follow the money, we're going to actually find that there's prevention money as well as treatment money. <clears throat> okay, so let's go back to this, and we're almost there. Possible mechanism for how this simple breath practice that you may or may not be doing. Let's just do it again, big breath in. Let it out slowly. Has to do with these bodies or uh, tissues in the uh, lungs and in the heart, in the cardiac area, right up here. And so when people say, take a big belly breath, that's a good idea. But then fill your lungs to here as well, because that's where these uh, uh, biological factors are. I'm not going to spend time on the stress response and the relaxation response, except to say that heart rate, blood pressure, muscle tension, metabolism, and breath rate all increase in the stress re response, and they all decrease in the relaxation response. So you are literally transforming the internal function of your body by simply triggering the relaxation response, and you can do it with that one single breath practice that I just uh, taught you. Here's the possible mechanism for that. Voluntary slow deep breathing, as in Qigong, Tai Chi, Pranayama, etc., regulates autonomic function through tissue stretch and interthoracic pressure-induced sympathetic inhibitory signals mediated by both lung stretch receptors and arterial baroceptors by synchronizing activities of the heart, lungs, limbic system, and cortex, uh, which many people call coherence, to increase vagal parasympathetic capacity or tone. Now, I know that's a lot of whoa, but um, <laughs> those are all bona fide factors and thoughts and so forth. Now, has the research been done on this? A lot has been done. And so normalizing this into people's lives, the simple idea of just taking a deep breath, go ahead, have one, notice how much it costs. And that's my email. I hope you'll send me a note. I'm happy to uh, provide the slides, by the way, but I think you're going to have a DVD of this. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate you. Thank you for your focus. Thank you.